there and welcome to Leading Change Conversations, the podcast where we tackle real-life challenges with leaders like you to make organizational change a breeze. In this episode, we talk about the risks to people and their well-being that come with transformation processes, and we will come up with concrete measures and actions for you to mitigate these risks. I am Ulrike Seminati, I am your host, and I train, coach, and inspire leaders and leadership teams to turn into successful change agents, to communicate with impact, and to lead with authenticity. So now, let me introduce you to our amazing guest, Jennifer Tam. Jennifer is based in Zurich, Switzerland. Through her company, Says Life, she works with corporations to govern people and well-being-related risks in their organization. When not developing corporate solutions around transformation and well-being, she spends time with her family and coaches youth ice hockey. Welcome, Jennifer. I'm very pleased to have you on board today. Hello, Elrika. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure. Do you want to add something? Because I, don't, I know that you have a vast, vast experience when it comes to transformation and change. My background is around people, risk management, and digital transformation. I spent the last 20, 25 years, not to date myself, working in large global corporations, primarily in the financial services area, so insurance and banking, as well as with some consulting positions. So I've had the pleasure of experiencing firsthand a lot of the changes that happen in an organization, regardless of whether it's a digital transformation or whether it's a cultural transformation. So change seems to bring about some consistencies and trends, no matter where you go and no matter which content you're in. And I founded a company, Says Life, about two years ago, and we specialize in automating the whole program for companies on how to manage and govern and assure their organization's well-being. So why did I go into the space? Why did I want to do a deep dive in people and well-being? Because, as I mentioned before, I kept seeing these trends occur in all the organizations I worked with around people. And now we know this, we know, you know, everything starts with people. We've heard this a lot, but it truly does. And uh, I myself have experienced, unfortunately, top leadership suicide in one of my previous organizations that I worked for, our CEO and our CFO. And it really hits home when you've known these people for quite a number of years and had to work with them very closely And so the whole organization is really shattered by these types of events. And what the organization is also shattered by, which doesn't get notoriety, which doesn't make headlines in the news, is all these daily occurrences yeah. around people and stress-related incidents in the organization. They fall through the crack, these topics, right? And it costs the company quite a lot of money. And when I was really... Uh, affected by the suicides of my previous organization's um, top leadership. I wanted to do a deeper dive in this because I kept seeing these trends around people and stress-related incidents. So I did my MBA in leading innovation and change, and I dedicated my dissertation into executive-level stress. So then I was able to work with six multinational organizations around specifically the topic of their stress levels and st executive stress. What does that mean? What does it entail? And it helped me launch the first version of my organization's product. It has now evolved over time, where prior to COVID, it was really, you know, waving a red flag. Hey, notice this issue. It's costing us. Now, because of COVID, it's the topic of people's stress-related incidents is becoming more prevalent in everyday life. It's, it's making more headlines now. And fortunately for my line of work, it's become of greater importance and it's getting a place on the table now. And actually it's placed on the table as in most cases now that I've seen number one, number two top priorities for a company to manage. One fact that I think people aren't aware of is that in the EU alone, it is estimated that stress-related incidents in an, the organizations across the EU are over 600 billion EU euros, okay, across, per year. So 600 billion per year, all right? Now, if you look at fraud, which has been traditionally the people issue that, pe that companies try to mitigate, try to look at, try to be aware of, fraud, right? 
Fraud is roughly around over 900 billion, maybe pushing a trillion per year across the EU. Mm -hmm. But stress-related incidents is following right behind that. And what my purpose is, is to help organizations look at this, understand it, mitigate it, measure it, and have an action-oriented uh, capabilities to actually solve these problems in a realistic, hands-on way. Mm. And so I think most, most leaders don't understand how expensive it truly is. And so we need to raise awareness, continue that movement. We need to provide solutions to organizations to address this topic and also remain humane. We need to, we need to stay authentic, as you mentioned, and we need to be kind because Someone's authenticity might not be so kind, and that's not going to help us all. Yeah, I think what you say, the numbers are, uh, the sheer numbers speak about themselves, I think. And what we see in organizations, I also see that shift, that there's more shift to humanity, which is also what I'm right. working on very strongly, about yeah. being more human-to-human -human relationships into yeah. work instead of human-to-tasks, you know, which is what is happening today. We're exactly. managing tasks right. executed by humans, but I think we should turn that equation completely around. And when you speak about, I like the idea that you have that focus on people risk for change, you know, I mean, risk management has been an area in organizations, at least in the bigger corporations I worked for that was always around. I remember like five or 10 years ago, even five years ago, before COVID, like you say, there mm -hmm. was such angle really on people risk or people risk right. was moving more around, okay, will we lose our people? You know, what is the fluctuation rate? These kind of things, exactly. relatively tangible and measurable things, right. but not this fact of people are stressed out, people might not be productive, people might not be able to focus anymore because they have fears or these kind of things. Right. What are actually these risks? If you can describe maybe the three or five top major people risks that you see that are coming up when it comes to transformations, when a company, let's say, on a on corporation announces a big transformational change, mm -hmm. that might be also job losses related to it, which is always the biggest fear of people. But yeah. what is that exactly, that people risk? How would you define it? Well, I would back up just one step before actually saying what the crunchy risks are. I would say that it's very usual for organizations to have some losses associated to the transformation programs, unfortunately, but it is quite usual. So when scoping out particularly large transformational programs, the biggest risk that they have is not understanding what the risks are around the people. That is the biggest risk, that they haven't actually done the risk evaluation, right? Yeah. Um, they don't have a proper program that's robust around people. Now, they might have some programs around well-being. They might have some engagement programs. And that's great. Keep those. Those are fant That's fantastic to have that focus. However, without understanding from the very beginning of these transformational programs, what is it that could happen? And then being action-oriented to say, if it did, what would be the issue? If it's not that big of an issue, then we might not apply any resources to prevent that. However, if it is a big enough issue, then we want to dedicate some action-oriented activities around the prevention of these types of pitfalls, right? Um, and that needs to be done at the very beginning. So I would say the first biggest risks around transformation and people is to not understand what those risks are. So the other big crunchy risks, to give some some concrete examples, um, you know, we hear about burnout a lot. So I think prior to COVID, burnout wasn't a word or a thing as prevalent as, as it is now. However, it was happening. So there's a term out there that maybe people haven't as uh, are well known as burnout, but it's called presenteeism. So you have everyone showing up. So you show up, but you're not really there because you're thinking of other things. You're not necessarily performing at your best. You're not necessarily feeling at your best, right? But you're there. So then you have basically everyone working on a transformation program that's so overworked, they're showing up. But are they really doing it with gusto? You know, are they, are they, are they motivated? Are people excited to be there? Or is it just kind of 
trudging along, keeping the hamster wheel going around and around and around, right? And that doesn't create high performance in anyone, you know. Why do you think presenteeism is there? What do you see as a major reason behind that? A root cause. Mm -hmm. So a root cause to presenteeism, uh, it could be overworking. And it's a very good question that you say, talk about root cause, because what we do at Says Life is we actually have part of our program, one of our functions is to automate the understanding of what the root cause is around some of these people issues. But what could it be? It could be any number of things. So you might end up with the understanding that the root cause comes from maybe two or three topics. And so in order to really apply the right type of programs or the right type of support for the people working on the program, you need to understand what where it's coming from and what would actually work to reduce the impact of presenteeism on a large transformation program. Mm -hmm. And you certainly don't want the presenteeism to escalate into burnout. So by understanding what those root causes are, by understanding where the people are coming from and what their concerns and needs are from the very beginning, it's very important. Mm -hmm. I think presenteeism is a good sign for a risk. It's like a red flag that is waved by the people because they, yeah. they show with their behavior, with their very passive behavior, right. that they don't agree that something's going wrong. Either they have lost trust or they have just lost motivation because it's the fifth change in one year and nothing is ever carried through until the end. And Correct. They yeah. Need anymore, yeah. for example, it can be the leadership issue, like you say. What I see often as well is that people who do that or who are just really, really demotivated often are demotivated because they are yeah. kind of forced into a specific behavior, a way of being uh -huh. that they aren't. You know, they are supposed to be agile. They are supposed to love the change. They are supposed yeah. to face the change. <laughs> and they don't. I mean, authentically, yeah. they can't. And so exactly. The authentic reaction could not be motivation. Maybe they're not behind this change. I have personally witnessed this more times than I would like to admit, especially when you're going around culture change, process change, shared service establishment is a huge change and brings out a lot of presenteeism. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because people are also frustrated because things yeah. might be changed that they mm -hmm. have done successfully, at least in right. their eyes, they have done it very successfully for many years. And suddenly, we don't even say goodbye to this wonderful work. I think that's also one thing. We just mm -hmm. move on to something new and it gets mm -hmm. erased and forgotten. And yeah. so we have done all of that for nothing of the past five years. And I think, as you say, there are many, many reasons. And there are many reasons, exactly. As you said, from leadership to what's happening in their own personal life. So, you know, to you really have to have mechanisms to be able to understand it fully because otherwise you might just be applying band-aids that don't really work. What could mechanisms be? You know, how could a company who is now knowing, okay, I have something big ahead of us and mm -hmm. there is a people risk. So like you say, first yeah. of all, understand that there is one, acknowledge that this needs to be looked at properly. Yeah. yeah. What are some parameters? Do you also work with KPIs or with uh, something that people can kind of measure? One of the Key points that I like to make is that you have a difference between a KPI and a KLI. KL, KPI, key performance indicator. KLI, key leading indicator. So I think you have to keep that in mind when you're approaching this type of solution process and understand what is your, what is our strategy to roll a program out like this? What is our strategy to mitigate any people issues and how do we how do we go about measuring it and what kind of tools can we use? And so I like to say, pay attention to what is the leading indicator versus the performance indicator. The performance indicator, a lot of times are readily used right now. You know, how many people have gone on burnout, right? Or how many people are on sick days? How So we already have, we being companies, companies already have, ways to track these HR KPIs and measurements, right? And in some of the larger companies, they are looking at this and they're tracking it and so forth, which is very important. What I like to do from a risk management perspective around people and well-being is to look at the KLIs, the leading indicators. These are preventative. So a leading indicator might not have anything to do with the symptom or the root cause problem is. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a preventative measure for us to say to signal ahead of the game 
what could raise an issue. And when we see these signals happening, when we see it above our acceptance levels, you know, this leading indicator, then we know we need to maybe do something about it and move some more action towards it. So if you're looking at burnout or presenteeism as the issue, what would be your KPI? As I mentioned before, it's a past view, what our performance has been. For the leading indicator, you'd want to look at what the root causes are. And so we've said it could be many causes. So once you understand what those upstream causes could be, then you take a look at those and then you say, okay, how do we measure those? What would be a signal? What would be some sort of figure? And it doesn't have to be a monetary figure. It could also be, a, you know, some other type of numerical measure around whatever that uh, root cause would be. And then we measure that and we understand, more importantly, what is our acceptance level to this? Yeah, so there's a lot of work to put into looking into it more in detail, analyzing the situation. Yeah. And like you say, setting also the right KPIs and KLIs. Mm -hmm. That is pretty tricky to understand what are these actually. I mean, KPIs, like you say, the HR related ones are right. pretty well known. Yeah. And they measure something indeed, but uh, when it comes to the KLIs, it's different. And I think it's a great groundwork, as I understand it, because that means that it's not only for this change, for this moment and this situation, yeah. that you set your company up differently. Yeah. Get actually a monitoring system in a certain way for being ready for whatever happens, because yeah. change is always awesome. Right. Sometimes that mm -hmm. was not planned. Sometimes you need to radically change things very quickly because outer circumstances force the company into something or market circumstances, something like that. Yeah. And you would have a framework, actually, what to watch out for right from the exactly. start. What is maybe a, a case that you can share with us where you can, we can illustrate this a bit in practice? I think one of the biggest change that is in my in my history and my experience has been around a, a change program that was about 300 people large. It was a digital transformation. And I had previously done it in my country. They were rolling it out then across the EU and so forth to come over and implement um, the software and uh, update all the processes around it, et cetera. There was a lot of technical issues that had been going on for quite a while, and it became just a very, very large, complex organization in itself. And the, the progress to goal completion wasn't coming as fast as it should have. And so they had to do, as you mentioned just right now, they had to do a quick change to get it back on its feet and back on rails. And what they did is they changed the leadership. It was very quick. They did a very quick change of leadership, which shocked the system. And then they had to take a strategic approach to looking at two different aspects of the digital transformation separately, and then achieving some of the other strategic goals in a different fashion. Um, and that with those leadership changes and the separation of duties, if you will, mm -hmm. enabled people and the organization to get much more specific um, about and clear about what the objectives needed to be. Now, I think at this point in time, um, this was years ago, they hadn't done any sort of formal assessment around people. We just didn't do it back then. Now, people is more of a topic. Back then, it, it was much more of an engagement activity as opposed to people can cost quite a lot of money and <laughs> to, to a transformational change program unless we're able to treat people correctly and take care of them the way that people should be taken care of. And so I experienced this. It was quite, I mean, there was, there was quite a lot of loss associated to this um, program. So, um, like I said, there was, it was about 300 people big. They lost over a year and a half, almost a year and a half's worth of work. So you can do the numbers there and estimate those for large global organizations. So it can, this is an extreme example, and, but, but there are others that are similar. So you really had to change the leadership on this. And when I was actually put onto the non-digital piece around culture, that's where it got very tricky. When you're looking at culture changes, 
like shared service platform change, there's so much fear that comes into an organization. It's incredible. And so how do you reduce the fear with people when strategically the company is going in this direction? So that is very difficult. And as I had mentioned, I did this deep dive dissertation on executive level stress. And what I learned through this program and this process is that whether you're a C-suite, C-suite minus one, or just the regular employee, right, that's coming to work with no managerial or leadership responsibilities, the impact of fear is similar. You know, everyone gets impacted by fear. And so when you're looking at cultural change, when you're looking at potential redundancies, when you're looking at unknown what's going to happen to my job and my livelihood, there's so much stress factor that comes into play. And it's a holistic perspective of stress factors, right? You know, this this incident where we had a shared service platform that needed to be established. So from the very beginning, so there were so many intricacies into getting this project in place and then actually implementing the project and then having a post-implementation program in place so it would be successful, that we had to work with all of these people that could potentially lose their job from it. And so it all came down to, in order to successfully get the numbers you needed, in order to successfully have people write down their processes, you had to ask them to do it. You had to work with them. And so, but in some cases, they just refused. And in other cases, they did it. And they did it with with zero motivation. Because as you would expect, that would be that would be the case. And so for us, it was very challenging. It was a really, really emotionally challenging place. Uh, and it has a very, very heavy, heavy reliance on relationship building. Yeah, I agree. That's for me also always the key. I think that is the key. You need yeah. to help leaders of all the intermediate levels that you have there. Yeah. To first of all, embrace the new situation in their own way. And yeah. it's maybe not about, they, they will not like the shared services platform as such, maybe. I think that's not the point. The right. point is that every single person can understand what's in it for me. For right. me, there's a learning curve there because I can lead my team through this transformation. And that is maybe what I really want to do. Maybe my motivation is that the people in my team feel good about what we are doing here. Maybe that's my motivation. And, uh, and what's the ultimate outcome? That's secondary in a certain way. Exactly. And I think we really need to work like that with the people who are actually the ones who carry it through the organization. So if they are not on board, and if you just give them a few bullet points on what they have to say, and it's not enough. <laughs> so that was the exactly. method from the past, I would say. Yeah, exactly. It's a method from the past. But I, like I said, I think we're really in an upward trajectory yeah. around embracing people, people topics, and not having a lot of stigma around hierarchies, you know, and um, and just looking at all of us as a unit and how do we move from point A to point B together is what's important. Yeah, exactly. As so we some last insights, what would you say when there's an organization who knows I have to face this big, big change coming up? Oh, what she's saying is interesting because I have not <laughs> thought about the people risk evaluation to do a proper mm -hmm. evaluation about that. Yeah. What are the first things they should watch out for apart from point number one, which you said, which is that you understand mm -hmm. first of all that you have to do it. <laughs> right. A, you have to do it is the biggest risk, right? Then where, where do you start ideally? So understanding everyone's needs. So you have to have a mechanism that allows you to easily understand what everyone's concerns are. Mm -hmm. You have to understand what the risks evaluated by the people participating in that program or that department. Okay. Mm -hmm. What do they, what do they evaluate? You really need to do a bottom up approach. And when I say bottom up, that includes so go from the bottom, but also don't forget about the top. You know, you need to go in a circular fashion because uh, the leadership need to be involved just as much as an entry-level employee. So all the needs need to be understood. You need to have a measurement capability, something that isn't overly complicated, and don't change the goalposts, meaning you cannot measure in point A today change what your, you know, components of that measurement 
and then six months later, measure it again, because that's not an apples to apples comparison. So when you decide to measure what you've decided to measure, measure it once, measure it the same way again. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then don't forget to take action. So that's wonderful if you have measurements. If you, It's wonderful if you know that people walk every day and do standing meetings. That's wonderful. That's great. Keep doing that stuff. Um, however, uh, don't just take the measurements, right? You know, so you need to have some actions around this. So if you have concerns and you can measure those concerns, you need to be able to assign people to take action um, and hopefully not a Band-Aid action. You need something that's actually addressing what we talked about earlier, the root causes, and hold people accountable, hold the team accountable, right, to address these topics and, and see some movement in these areas before you remeasure. To wrap up our conversation around this, you know, in the EU, this is becoming such an important topic that starting January of 2024, all mid-sized large companies are required now to report on the UN sustainability goals. There's 17 of them, and one of them is health and well-being, number three. So they need to be able to look at and report on, show the risks and opportunities and govern the well-being um, programs of the organization. It's becoming mainstream to do this. And now companies are going to be required in the EU to take on these measures going forward. So I see that as a very positive message. Yes, me too. Absolutely. And I think it's absolutely great news that it's like that. Seeing this today, and especially also with the younger generation coming in who mm -hmm. work differently, who look at change differently. I mean, the whole engagement and organization that we have seen so far is changing. We have to adapt to a different management style, a different leadership style is better, the better word for it, actually. Yeah. And right. um, exactly. yeah, thinking about this from that perspective, I think is interesting because often we we look into it from, a, yeah, we have to embrace that from this engagement perspective. Yeah. But the other side of the medal is actually the risk behind that. There is no engagement. What's happening then? And what is when we are falling below that line and yeah. how to mitigate that? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. It was great to see you and um, it's great to be here. And thank you for giving the platform to talk about this important important mission that we have. Yeah, it was my pleasure to have you. And uh, thank you for sharing all of these really, really valuable insights that we have. You're welcome. You're welcome. Hope to see you again. Thanks, everyone, for listening. So, and thank you to our audience for tuning into Leading Change Conversations today. I hope you found our discussion inspiring and informative. And if you enjoyed it, please remember to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. And plus, you can also sign up for our newsletter to access our practical transformation roadmaps on a regular basis. So if you want to improve your own skills on leading change as a leader or communicating more effectively, you can check out my courses for individuals on my website. Uh, there's a bunch of nice courses coming up around topics like overcoming procrastination, surmounting so change resistance, communicating with impact, also influencing through presence and others. And last but not least, if you want to become a guest, then just go on my website, leadingchangeconversations.com and pick a slot of your choice in my calendar so that we can discuss options. I'm surely looking forward to getting to know you. And until next time, keep leading, keep learning and making a difference. Thank you. Thank you.